Okay. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chris Rees, and I was recently elected chairman of the society. So welcome, whether you're in the room or online. Uh, this afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Keisler. Steve has had a varied career in the defense and intelligence community in the United States. Uh, has held positions as strategic computing program manager at DARPA uh, and director of systems architecture and technical advisor to the Sergeant at Arms of the US Senate. I hope he wasn't there at the crucial moment when it was attacked. <laughs> and he's also been an adjunct professor of engineering at George Washington University for many, many years. And he has written 16 books and many papers. Uh, and of those 16, nine volumes are part of his historical computing machines series. Uh, so very well qualified. And in an age when we can't pick up a newspaper without reading about AI, uh, I read the other day that serious articles about AI uh, hitting the press every two seconds. Uh, so we look forward to a spot of history. Steve. Share the screen here. So, got it. Share the screen. Again. Yes. You see it shared, Nick? You see it shared? Try again. Technology. What well, does computer Multiple participants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it says shared. So, okay, we'll see if it works. Okay. Um, so, as uh, Chris mentioned, oops, I just got rid of my thing there and got people there. Let's see what's happening here. It's not on the screen. The screen. It looks like you've shared the wrong uh, camera or, or, or screen. Really? It's on two. Oh, I didn't like that. Okay, there we go. I pressed the wrong the thing at the wrong time. There we go. How about that? Okay. Um, so as uh, Chris mentioned, my name is Steve Keisler. Um, I'm from the USA. Um, I want to say hello to, to all present today. Good afternoon to those remotely and good morning to those remotely from other places. Um, I appreciate the invitation from Roger and Chris to come talk with you about a neat project called Modernization. And uh, this is a, a joint effort of a group called the interlisp.org group. You are uh, still sharing the wrong screen. You right. the presenter's PowerPoint <laughs> screen rather than the audience PowerPoint screen. Oh, you want me to? You want me to, to talk to the to the audience rather than the? Uh, I need to be able to see the uh, slides. Split screen. That's going to be long, but I'm going to call the expert in here to figure out what's going on. He's start calling names, but. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I clicked on the screen and I clicked on the next. Yes, exactly. Next, what? I see that. Here, I'm just going to I clicked on that. We have trouble with that. Here with all of Then I clicked on this. Okay. We want this one. Years are coming to There it is. Got it. Okay, I see it now. <laughs> it's got the little green box around it, so now we know we're good. Okay. So anyway, um, let's get started then. <laughs> hey, you don't want to work. All right. Don't work. How about that? <laughs> Yeah, 
it's, yep. it's changed. Yep. Uh, takes, oh, it's slow. Okay, sorry. But this is who I am. We, don't, we are, Chris already mentioned a couple of things, so we won't talk about that. Um, out of there. Uh, you can read that later if you're interested. Um, I hope, there we go. This is uh, some of the things I've written. So there's four books that are in the Interlisp series. I started back in 85 uh, when I had a D machine, a Xerox D machine in my office at DARPA. I wrote the language and its usage, then uh, updated it uh, when I started with the group. Uh, I had started a second volume, Interlisp lost ground and uh, became uh, overtaken by common list. But when we restarted this project, uh, I decided to take that second book and expand it into two. And I'm working on the Loops book, which is almost done, probably end of December, early January. <laughs> And then I'll do one more, which will be on rule-based programming in Interlisp and Loops. Um, I also embark on a historical computing machine series. You can see the titles there. The last one, English Computer Systems, I'm almost two-thirds, maybe three-fourths done, and hopefully to have that submitted to the publisher sometimes in uh, January, maybe, I think. Um, and I'm using the Computer Conservation Society Resurrection Bulletins. Uh, for source material as well as everything else I've been able to collect on the web. And so we'll see how it turns out, okay? Um, so the Medley project, um, we have some discussion in the group about uh, what this is about. Originally, this was called Interlisp, and I'll show you a little bit of the history in a few moments. Um, and then uh, we called it the Medley Interlisp project because Medley was the last official release from Xerox Park. Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which is now part of Stanford uh, Research Institute, the SRI, um, which Xerox donated the whole park, which is a nice big building in Palo Alto, plus all of the uh, stuff that they have, and uh, I guess some of their IP to SRI. So that was kind of interesting. So this is just a picture of a screen that you will see if you fire up Interlisp. All right. Now, the Medley project, we, we, we started and it was built for a set of machines called D machines. And D machines were custom processors built by Xerox Park. And I'll give you a list of those in a short bit. And uh, they were custom processors and they were pretty good. They were pretty fast. Um, but as I said, over time, uh, Common Lisp came to the fore, uh, overtook Interlisp. And because Interlisp was running on custom processors, it lost to uh, the uh, common list, which was implemented on a lot of different machines, sex and symbolics and TI explorers and so forth. Um, so what we've done over the past three years, mostly uh, is a core group of guys have been working on the code to make it run on modern operating system play platforms. And I'll go into that in a minute. A lot has been done and a lot waits to be done. And we're constantly looking for assistance. And so we see collaborative efforts with anybody who wants to participate, whether universities or groups or whatever. So what's Medley? Medley is uh, software for the, was software for the Xerox Lisp machines from the late 1960s to the early 1990s. And it provides a graphical user interface, one of the first, okay? Xerox had pioneered that on the Alto, which was an earlier machine. Um, and uh, they developed these ideas as part of their research into how to build better user interfaces. That was Park's mission. How to enable people to do better work in their office environment. Okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about history, just to give you a sense of where we came from, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, key thing, we're trying to um, build a legacy of information to help software historians in the future. All the guys that are currently in the, the group are pretty much in their upper years, 60s and better. And so we're hoping that we're gonna get some younger folks to come along, continue to work on the project, and also to preserve the history of this uh, effort. And we have a lot of historical documentation on LISP and other things in the Zotero repository that's publicly available, in case anybody's interested in reading it. The source code is available on GitHub. Mako, the emulator, Medley Interlisp, the system, and all of the utilities and software applications that go with it, well, except for one at the moment. So just real quick, John McCarthy, everybody's heard of him, I'm sure, MIT mathematician, wants to basically develop a language to express mathematics so he can figure out how to manipulate them. And so uh, he built something for the IBM 704709, 
a couple people put it onto a PD P1, which was a real exercise at MIT. This was only an 8K bit byte, sorry, 8K word machine, okay, with 16 bits. Uh, in 67, DARPA ordered a contract to port it to other machines and to develop it further. And that was because DARPA at that time was really pushing AI, okay? Uh, a couple of people, Danny, Bob Brown, and Ben Wigbright developed the spaghetti stack. Uh, we won't go into that. It's just a way to interlace different processors working, uh, sorry, different processes working uh, on different programs. And then eventually, Bob Rowe and Teitelman moved to Palo, Palo Alto Research Center, and BBN List was renamed uh, Interlisp. Um, a little bit more history, you can read this. It uh, just mentions different packages. Uh, the break package, DWIM, do what I mean, which was a way of saying, okay, here's something I want to do, and then you could record it, and every time you typed in something later on, it would replace what you typed in with something that uh, was uh, what you had told it to replace it with. Not quite macros, but something more powerful. Break package, history lists, master scope, which does not, is a very powerful tool for finding out where things are, who calls whom, what variables are called, what variables are changed, et cetera. This stuff doesn't exist in modern day IDEs, which is really in incredible given that this is now 40 plus years old. Um, and then uh, we developed, uh, or the Xerox Park developed a Windows based machine. And later on, they built a high performance processor called the Dorado. Okay, so in the 80s, uh, by that time, DARPA had really invested a lot in Interlisp as other agencies and groups had. And so what happens is they started building their customized processors for commercial development okay, and uh, commercial sales. And so uh, in, at the FJCC in 1988, they released the Xerox 1100 scientific workstation called the Dolphin. I, um, I uh, used those early on, and then the Interlist programming environment as an ecosystem. So on the D machines, the Interlisp was the operating system, <laughs> as well as the application development system and the user interface and had a bunch of tools. On the current machines, we'll talk about that in a minute, it's called the Mako emulator, okay? And so Arc went on to build a series of machines, the Dolphin, the Daybreak, the Dandelion, and the Dorado, all modernizations all quite a bit faster each succeeding generation. So the Dorado was about the third generation, I think. Daybreak, the 1186 was the last generation. I had one of those in my office at DARPA for a couple of years uh, while I was working on a couple of different projects. Um, in the early to late 1980s, Fuji Xerox decided, well, this is cool. We have the fifth generation project out of Japan, right? And they wanted to somehow have a capability to use Interlisp for their research. And so they tried to develop a risk processor implementation of virtual bytecodes using a virtual machine, okay? So the underlying infrastructure for Interlisp was a virtual machine, and then Interlisp called those bytecodes, okay? So the initial medley release was 88 um, and so forth. In 89, we, they, Xerox Park spun it off. They saw the writing on the wall, you know, common list was gonna take take over. And so they spun it off to give somebody else a chance to market it and commercialize it. But uh, Anvos, which was a former DARPA employee, uh, sorry, DARPA, Xerox employee, uh, created a company called Anvos, but it opened and closed pretty quickly, unfortunately. Um, and then another one was Venue, uh, which was owned by John Sabalsk, one of the developers as well. So 92, thereabouts, last public release of Medley. And then it was pretty much archived thereafter at Xerox Park. However, we had close and close implementation commonless object system. We had uh, something for DOS, an implementation on DOS 4.0 on a IBM PC compatible machine um, on the Xerox 1186 to Daybreak, which was a fairly powerful processor. And then we started to have applications, note cards, loops, and uh, rooms, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, the Fuji Xerox emulator was renamed Mako. What happened was Fuji Xerox turned it over to Xerox Park, and some of the original people who formed our group are, worked heavily to make the Mako emulator work on Suns and Sun Microsystems systems and Linux machines. And uh, 
Then in the 2010s, um, some of those original people decided, hey, we're going to try to modernize and resurrect Interlisp. And as a result, uh, the Medley Project finally began in 2020. Uh, one of the things they said was, okay, let's start with the Mako emulator and make that work on Linux, on Windows, and on Mac OS. All right. Uh, and so the emulator, which was written in C, was mostly ported to uh, uh, those different platforms uh, with some trials and tribulations. And I'll mention a few of those in a little bit. Additional documentation since 21 by project man ma members, including me, adapting to modern hardware and operating systems and continued modernization. And we continue to now also to develop further applications and we're also testing the common list compatibility because during the mid eighties, um, Strux integrated a version of common list sharing the same infrastructure as Interlisp on, uh, in, on the D machines. And now what we're trying to do is make sure that that common list uh, conforms to, well, currently C CLTL1 that is the common list for original specification and also checking for CLTL2 which is the most recent spec of common list. Uh, so to date, we have it running on three platforms, three different kinds of platforms. Actually, there's more. Uh, we have it running on Windows 10 and 11. We have it running on Mac OS systems, okay, which have their history from uh, CMU Mock and Linux and so forth. And it's running on Linux systems. Okay, You can also get a version of it that runs using WSL on Windows systems as well. And I've had both of those, but now I use the SIGWIN implementation, which is much better uh, for my machines. All right. It's uh, installers for each of those. It's one click, download the installer, click on it, and boom, you've got an Interlisp system ready to run. It's really nice. Um, it's also been apparently ported to the Raspberry Pi, uh, though I haven't seen that. And we also have an online version if you want to try it out. Okay, and I'll show you a picture of the screen in a minute. And then there are a couple of applications, loops, note cards, and rooms, which I'll talk about. Um, and we're preparing additional documentation. So I'm writing the loops book now. We're rewriting sort of the manual, making it more understandable. It was written for people who yeah. knew loops. And uh, I'm trying to write it to make it uh, an introductory for loops so people can learn how to use loops. The performance, about a thousand times faster than the Dorado which was the very high performance machine. It's uh, available address space was greatly increased. So right now when I um, fire up my system on my Windows machine, it creates a virtual memory of about 256 gigabyte. However, the implementation only requires somewhere around four to six megabytes for Interlisp, okay, which is pretty uh, efficient. So you have a large space to play with in terms of applications. We are testing common list support with several programs. I have a library of common list programs at home that I'm starting to test to see to make sure that it does conform to the CLTL specification. The history of Interlisp that I've just given to you is the history of AI, okay? Because DARPA sponsored Interlisp. They also sponsored common list later, but they sponsored Interlisp and their goal was to propagate AI, to develop AI and make it a usable technology and technique for solving problems. So um, just the applications, like I say, we'll talk to them about them in a few minutes, but I just wanted to show you uh, what they are. All right, well, I'll, actually I'm gonna do it now. I forgot we swapped this. So one of them is lexical functional grammar. One of the guys in the team, Ron Kaplan, is uh, developed LFG with others, and it's a model for linguistics analysis um, and I won't read that stuff to you. Uh, you. If you want to do it, you can look it up online. And there's a nice blurb on Tinkle Wikipedia that talks about it. But basically, the idea is how do we parse and process natural language? Okay. And in particular, English. And so this was uh, a research effort that's ongoing as to theory behind linguistic analysis. And this runs on our systems, the three the two major systems that I talked about. Um, Rooms was an interface to the Medley environment. So when I showed you the picture of Medley before, what you saw was the user interface. Dotted background, had lots of windows up and you can click on a window and bring that to the fore and 
you could then do something in that window. And then if you want to go to another window, click on that one and you can start working in that window. Okay. So rooms was an idea to say, okay, we have, and remember going back to Xerox Park, Xerox Park was trying to automate the office environment. Okay. Um, some of you may have heard of the ill-fated star 8010, which was sort of like a, uh, uh, I guess a automated office on a machine. And it was built on top of uh, some of the ideas from Interlisp. Each room in rooms was a workspace in which you could take notes, you could show pictures, you could uh, have other applications running, and you could switch from one room to another just by clicking on that room. So just like we did on the windows, okay, you had these rooms, and I'll show you a picture of rooms in a minute. You could click on a room or on a card, basically, uh, a room, and go and do something, and each room could be different have a different function or application in it. And Rooms was extensible so that users create could create their own interfaces, their own windows, all right, and their own applications, all right? And that was one of the keynotes of Interlisp that we pushed, that was pushed to early on and we pushed today, the idea that users are in control and they can create their own applications. We give them a whole bunch of tools to do that. In each room, there are icons called doors, and those were the things that allowed you to open new rooms up, okay? And close rooms if you wanted to. And so you could have as many rooms as your machine could stand. Uh, being performance sometimes was an issue. This is a picture of rooms, okay? So it shows you a couple of things, sort of the common things you might have on top of your desktop in some cases, okay? And there were more. And uh, so you could click on any one of those. You could go check your mail do project planning, you could look, the, look up a reference library, you could do filing, et cetera. Okay, so Rooms was a very powerful idea and its ideas have basically propagated throughout many other projects that have come out from other vendors as well. Note cards was another idea. The idea was that people, uh, the people at Xerox Park were researchers and they also didn't realize that people in an office environment needed to make notes about things they were doing. You know, oh, here's my to-do list, okay? Call the wife and tell her that uh, she's got to prepare dinner for 20 or something like that. As one of my bosses was not notorious for doing, he'd, he'd send people to his house to have dinner, wouldn't tell his wife, and then <laughs> they would show up and she wouldn't, and he wouldn't. So, you know, it's kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy there. Uh, so the note cards was an extensible framework. And it was a precursor to the early hypermedia environment, much before HyperCard. It includes Apple's. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, HyperCard, but it's a very powerful system, which was really great. I uh, programmed in that for my uh, human computer interaction class that I taught at GW. So a note card was a generalization of a three by five paper card. And you could do a bunch of things on it. You could post uh, basically pictures on it. You could post notes. You could even have links to other cards so that you had a stack of cards, if you will, or a sequence of cards, just like HyperCard. But you could also have links to other files out exterior to the new cards environment. All right. And it was very nice. It was very powerful. And that runs today as well. And uh, it's available, as I said, uh, from our GitHub repository. Here's a picture of note cards. Looks a lot like... Uh, cards to a certain extent, okay. but it's not, it was a precursor to it. And here's another picture uh, with a slightly different approach. Notice that one of the things we had early on was the ability to draw trees and graphs of structures, okay? You still can't do that in, for example, NetBeans today or Eclipse, or I'm not sure about IntelliJ, but I know BlueJ, which is another IDE, you can do this graphical structure of your program in a uh, window, okay? And you can see that it had some very powerful capabilities there. Loops is the Lisp object-oriented programming system. So this is different than Close. Close came later. Close is object-based, not object-oriented, as far as I can tell, okay? Whereas Lisp is object-oriented and has inheritance in all the classes that you define, okay? Um, you see a picture of down in the lower left corner there of the trucking game. The trucking game was written by Xerox Park to teach people how to program in loops, okay? And uh, we're in the process of resurrecting that. We've got a couple issues we've got to work out. 
with respect to the code, but most of it, it loads up and it seems to run until it hits a glitch and we're not quite sure what it is yet, but we're working on it. Um, it includes three paradigms in addition to your standard imperative functional programming paradigms, object-oriented systems, rule-based systems, and access-oriented systems. As access-oriented systems, uh, we call them active values, okay? And uh, they're sort of like uh, aspect-oriented programming, okay, which came out of uh, PARC as well. Uh, the picture on the right is a group of people uh, gathered around a terminal. I think we were talking to a Dorado. I'm in the upper right corner, by the way. This was June 1983. I uh, went out there to take the loop second, first or second loops course. And uh, so I was engaged in writing a trucking player, actor, I should say, to participate in the game. Unfortunately, we didn't make it quite as well as some of the other guys, but it was fun. Okay. And so we're trying to resurrect that game so people can play it and have fun and learn about object-oriented programming. Um, one of the nice things about loops was that uh, it had a lot of key ways to track how things were going. And so gadgets, okay, as you see on the screen, a lot of dials and gadgets and gauges. So you could attach these using access values, you could attach these to a variable in your loops program. Every time the loops variable changed its value, it would change the gauge on the screen to, to pick what was going. So if your truck was moving from one location to another in the game and you press the accelerator and said, zoom up, you would see the speed dial go up on your screen. You could also see the quantities of resources that you held Okay, the number of things that you had. And at the bottom, of course, you can see that we had a graphical environment that showed you the relationships between the different classes in the trucking game. And that's also available for all of the loops code as well. Okay. So the last one, strads. Um, this code's not available right now. Okay. I have a copy since I funded it at DARPA and I'm trying to make it work on. Uh, interlisp on our modern machines. It was developed largely by Doug Lennett, who just passed away at the end of August. Uh, and uh, ESL, which was a company out in San Jose, California. This was part of my Fleet Command Center Battle Management Program uh, of the DARPA Strategic Computing Program, which was uh, DARPA's answer to the fifth generation project. Um, and the idea was to focus on strategic planning and decision-making in crises in, in our case, in the Pacific theater, where our friends in Russia or the Soviet Union at that time were uh, causing some turmoil. And we provided scenario explanation, exploration for analysts to facilitate situational understanding and decision making. So it was a simulator. The idea was to be able to simulate scenarios and run them through and see what the possible results were. And this was particularly important because what it did is facilitated that some a problem that many analysts had, which was Analysts are well trained, so they knew what the answer was in most cases. They just didn't quite know how to get there sometimes, okay? And so we were trying to set up scenarios such that they would be able to run the scenario with a set of parameters, run it through to the end, see what the steps were each step of the way and what the end result was, okay? And if you change the rules, which you could do, or you change the parameters, you would get different outcomes for a particular scenario. And so this was very important. This was based on to some extent, but uh, only as a precursor to Doug Lennett's Eurisco, if you've ever heard of that uh, AI program. And so it was a symbolic rule-based system with objects. It was based on Lennett's RL1 language, which is also a tech report that's available out there. And the idea was to start to help people understand how things would unfold in a scenario, in a crisis, and to be able to explore the different parameters and the different ways we might be able to respond to that crisis uh, if it occurred. Our eventual goal was to introduce symbolic ML techniques to learn patterns and write new roles. But unfortunately, I left DARPA and uh, Doug Lennett left uh, Stanford, uh, I, yeah, Stanford and MCC down in Austin, Texas, and went on to other pursuits. He founded PsychOR, which is the psych common sense, uh, if you will, knowledge base uh, that he's been, had been developing for 40 years until his untime, uh, untimely death. Okay. All right, but it was an innovative new approach to geopolitical simulation. <laughs> I got the code, and what I'm trying to do is to resurrect that and make it run. But I 
have to get the loops book done first before I can sort of really play with and truck it first before I do that. Okay, so this is just a picture. It's a little might be a little hard to see, but just to give you an idea, on the right was the uh, <clears throat> the agenda and the different elements. There were actors, there were events, there were rules, scripts, and scenarios. So you had actors like USA, Libya, American Red Cross. Okay. If you talk about Libya, you might say, well, I got the Libya, the country, I've got the Libyan government as an actor, I've got the Libyan people as an actor. I might have a uh, a protest group or insurgent group in Libya that was fighting against the government. All right. So all those would have been actors. I could define scenarios such as the Taliban uh, attacks U.S. citizens. Well, actually, that was a little bit later. But we were talking about things like Egypt declared a financial crisis and sought financial aid was one of the ones we had. We also had looked at the um, red flag, it was a red flag, no, uh, <clears throat> the Japanese Red Army Group that attacked Lodes Airport and massacred a number of uh, citizens there and what the response was, how different countries would react, respond and to it. We had uh, rules that defined that and we had events like terrorist attack, announcements, military ops, food riots, assassination, all sorts of things. So there's about 300 rules, about, sorry, 300 actors, about 200 rules, um, and uh, about four scenarios that we were working with at the time. Okay, so, and you can see some examples of uh, an event. Egyptian can't pay loans and it requests emergency aid. So it makes two announcements, then the rules that execute, scripts used to create the events and events to add it to the queue. Okay, so this was, an interesting way to start doing simulation. And uh, it was different from discrete simulation in the sense that you were using numbers because most of the information captured in the simulation was symbolic, okay? So we were reasoning about symbolic events and symbolic you know, atoms in LISP that represented different kinds of representations of information. We're gonna sort of move over to how we did modernization. So I was thinking about how to start this and I said, resurrection begets modernization, okay? And the idea was that, as I said, the original developers decided to resurrect Medley and make it run on modern platforms. And so that was required a certain amount of modernization, okay? And Mako was the emulator that had been developed by Xerox Park based on the Fuji Xerox code on older Unix and DOS systems, and now we had to make it on modern operating systems. So whereas Interlisp was originally the operating system for the D machines, now it was going to be an application, in effect, running on top of the emulator, all right, which was running on top of an operating system, one of the modern operating systems, Mac OS, Linux, Unix, and Windows, all right? back one, I think. Oh, that's not good. I want to go back, sorry. Right, Oops. that's not good either, huh? Get out of there. Apologize, I'm a little fumble, fumble, fumble fingered. There we go. So here's some of the medley features. I've mentioned these briefly before, but, uh, <laughs> We have what is called an interactive software development environment. The idea is you're going to work with the machine as opposed to, for example, when I was a full train programmer, touching cards, submitting a card deck to my, our IBM 7094 at Maryland, and then getting back the results and figuring out what was wrong, punching a few new cards and resubmitting it again. And we called this the residential programming environment. Why did we call it that? Because everything is done within that environment, editing, compiling, linking to other programs, all right, and storing things on the file. So in fact, the memory of the machine, the virtual memory of the Interlisp environment was really a extension of the files out on disks, okay? So you edited a file in memory and then you could say, okay, I'm done. And Interlisp would automatically ask you if you had not saved it, do you wanna save this file? Do you wanna save this file, et cetera? So the ground truth was always on the disk in the file, all right? And But you could bring in files at any time and work with them. We had do what I mean, which I 
mentioned already, we had a statistical performance monitoring system called SPY, which allowed you to do some performance analysis of your program. Um, the inspector, which was allowed you to look at any object in the system. So if you had a uh, instance of an object and you wanted to see what the values of the, oops, did that disappear? Okay. Uh, you wanted to see what the values of the attributes of the object were, you could use inspect to open up that object and you got a presentation of its values, okay? Um, Sketch was a line art drawing. I haven't worked with that. Edit was a just a text-based editor. All right, we had so we had one of those, and that allowed us to do editing of documents and things like that. Uh, history list. This was one of the first implementations, perhaps the original implementation of a history list. All right. So we had fix, redo, edit operators on previous commands. So you went and, as I'm fairly fumble fingered at times, I could type a command and there was an error in it. Right. So I could go down and the next prompt and say fix minus one. And then it bring back minus one, bring back the previous command. And I could use the cursor to go and find the offending character and then retype it and then say execute by just pressing the at the end of it and it would execute that command. One of the key things was the structure editor. So everybody knows that hope, hopefully that Lisp is all list based. Everything's a list, even functions and every data set, data type, right? Okay. And so the structure editor knows how to uh, ma manage and manipulate and maneuver or navigate, if you will, through those structures. And it will pretty print to a certain extent those structures when you open up a file in Sedit, which is the structure editor. Um, and uh, sometimes it's a little hard, however, to get used to the way that it displays stuff. But uh, after a while, you come very familiar with it and comfortable with it. The so file browser, you can open inspector or browser on a file, just as you're expecting it. And the break package was for debugging, one of the earliest debugging packages uh, that were symbolically based and were able to uh, work with uh, the current value of the program in memory, okay? Um, the file and record package, uh, the record package just allowed you to do records, normal record management. Uh, and the file package, as I said, was a package that you had an instance in memory, but the ground truth was on the disk and you could save at any time, copy in memory to the disk and then bring it back in if you wanted. Of course, loops we've talked about, the trucking game, and there were a couple other games. And uh, like I say, we're trying to get common some common list uh, I capabilities running, programs running of interesting things. And if so, then uh, they'll be available as well. Just a picture of one of the games, Pac-Man. Okay, this was one of the first ones that apparently was built. Um, and you fire it up and let it run, and the uh, little guys run through the maze, right? Um, which is kind of interesting, but after a while, you probably get tired of it, right? <laughs> uh, Interlisp and Common Lisp. Okay, so Interlisp was built working in the 80s, and Common Lisp was coming up. And so Park decided we're going to integrate Common Lisp into the Interlisp ecosystem. And so the Common Lisp system <coughs> shares data structures and the packaging mechanism mechanism with Interlisp, okay? And the idea is that they have a common infrastructure. Now, uh, obviously the names of common list functions are quite different from the Interlisp functions. And so uh, what happens is we use the package prefixes, XCL and Interlisp uh, for the read tables because uh, the read tables for the two languages were somewhat different in the way they interpreted some of the character codes. Similarly, execs, there was CL eval for evaluating a common list program. And in fact, when you fire up Interlist, what you get now is you get a window, which is the XCL window, which allows you to run common list. And you get the Interlist window, which is allowing you to run the Interlist code. But I can go over to the common list window and say IL colon some function name, and it'll run the Interlist function from the common list window. Similarly, I can go to the Interlist window and say CL colon some function name, and it'll run, in the com run the common list function out of the inner list window, which is kind of neat because again, shared infrastructure underneath, right? Uh, functions, you have to declare whether they're a common list, <laughs> a common list function or an IL inner list function that just CL colon or IL colon. And it incorporates the common list object system. Um, but like I said, the common list object system in my belief is object based, not object oriented. So um, enough said. 
And then, as I said, we're collecting uh, a library of common list programs. Uh, I have a lot of them that I've scoured the web for over the years, but I just have to get to the point where I can test them, make sure they run and write a little bit of documentation or an introduction to that program before we're going to post it anyplace uh, to make it available. Medley Online. We have a version of Medline on, online. You don't have to load it to your machine. You can go online and play with it. You can also save stuff okay, on a, a directory out there online. However, we don't allow you to save a whole heck of a lot because this is more an entry to lower the barrier to accessing Lisp and allowing people to learn something about it. And uh, so you can go online, you create an account, and then uh, once you create an account, you can then fire up uh, online into Lisp and play with it. And do everything that's available on the downloaded version is available online. Loops is there, no colors is there, et cetera. So this is a very powerful technique, very interesting idea because it allows you to um, take your things that you want to work on, have them work online. And uh, if you can save them to files, then you can download the files for perhaps interlisp on your machine. All right. So just like uh, uh, the availability, we can run interlisp from anywhere now, almost. It depends on how more, many more machines we port it to, of course. All right. So modernizing. So this is where we're going to hit, hit the rubber, right? What are the problems we came up with? This is the modernization part. And this is where the software archaeology, which I forgot to mention, I had read an article in communications, the ACM about six years ago, and it mentioned software archaeology. And I said, oh, that's a pretty interesting idea. So when I joined the group, I figured, and we were going to talk about this talk, I said, hey, this is what we're doing. So that's why it's called software archaeology, right? And so our idea was we need to know where we are, where you want to go, and how to get there. That's our sort of approach, okay? That means we had to analyze the old code, both the emulator and the Medley Interlisp implementation. We then had to figure out, well, where do we want to go? What things do we have to do to make it run on these different operating system platforms, Linux, Windows, and Mac OS, um, and uh, I forget what's on Raspberry Pi. I haven't played with that, uh, but I think it might be it might be Android, but I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so the idea was adapt Medley to new platforms. That means it makes it available to a much, much larger universe of potential centralists, okay? Um, and the idea was to make it work better than it did on the Xerox D machines, which, you know, were 40 years old, right? So they were kind of old and slow. And now we have machines that are thousands of times faster. We also wanted to reduce the barriers to entry. So that's why we have Mintralisp online. If you want to get started, you can play with it online and then you can move over to download an installer from our GitHub machine and install it on your local machine. One. And so there's a step up capability to get started and then to become more proficient at using it. And we also wanted to improve reliability on modern machines. One of the things we found that there were still some code errors in the original code. And my colleagues who are working with the code have found that and are making corrections to them as we go. Okay. So our reliability is improving uh, every month, every two months or whatever, as we post new versions of the uh, code out to the uh, GitHub site, okay? One of those things was character encoding. Interlisp used XCCS, which was the Xerox character um, system. That was used for their networking capabilities because Xerox, of course, was an originator of the Ethernet with DEC and Intel um, and several protocols that they used uh, for their networking and for their products, all right? Uh, and that was 8-bit code. And so now we wanted to encompass a larger set of characters, perhaps even foreign character sets. So we haven't dallied in that yet, as far as I know. Uh, and so we went to UTF-8 Unicode. Okay? And so we're still finding some places where we have to make changes. But by and large, it's now working with UTF-8 Unicode. Um, one of the things that we had to do that... Uh, one of the guys who was working on TEDIT and other elements of the system had to find out wherever characters were read and written, and then had to change the function calls in such a way to handle UTF-8 code. And of course, what were the implications for some of the reasoning or the functional code that was dependent on reading those characters? So we did that. 
and then determine the format of characters on files and their encoding. And that's still a little bit of an ongoing project. Okay. One of the things we do is to enhance the ability to generate PDF documents. So TEDIT had its own encoding scheme. And that was developed at Xerox and largely because, again, think all of us automation, right? So the idea was that they wanted to have the most efficient encoding scheme because they were looking to use that for a varied set of products. As products. For example, there are reproducing machines. The Star 8010, which was their office automation workstation, though so it was about $10,000 $10, a pop. So it was a little beyond most people's uh, financial resources, I should say. Um, and so one of the things uh, that they did was to generate PostScript from internal formats. We have a converter from TEDIP, internal co coding and format to PostScript. And then we interface to a Unix Linux utility to convert PS to PDF code. And then we can display it on an external uh, viewer. We haven't quite yet got around to develop, uh, prevent presenting PDF in Windows on through Interlisp, okay? Then modernizing Windows operation. So when I showed you the picture, uh, you saw there were Windows and there were a whole bunch of functions in the Windows management system that allowed you to manipulate those windows, open new windows, uh, display things, et cetera, in the windows. But uh, they were a very early implementation of windows, very powerful, but still, you wouldn't find a lot of the modernization capabilities that are available today in some cases. So we had to initiate uh, functional changes to uh, handle moving and resizing, select and drag, rather than menu selection, which was the original way that you picked functions for Windows. Um, integrate with the external clipboard, okay, of the operating system. Uh, Unix, uh, sorry, not Unix, but uh, Interlisp and the D-Machines do not have an external clip. <laughs> All right. uh, provide wheel mouse and trackpad scrolling capability, though there's still a couple issues with the, th the fact that Xerox produced a three-button mouse, and just about every one of the machines I know today, including mine, have a two-button mouse. So we have to uh, basically emulate the third button using a meta key, which required some reprogramming of character codes to handle basically uh, the meta key implementation. Um, and then one of my colleagues uh, who also did the online version said, ah, we were using WSL, Windows uh, Simulator uh, for um, Windows. Uh, and uh, he looked into SIGWIN. Well, first we looked into Docker. Docker turned out to be very <laughs> performance expensive and it has some limitations. So he looked into SIGWIN and SIGWIN turned out to be a blessing. It really works well. Okay, and what it does is allow you to run it on native mode Windows 10 and 11 rather than using WSL. <laughs> nice. So I have it running on my laptop and also on my tower at home, and uh, it's pretty fast. So it's really nice. And then we synchronize the meta keys across Medley subsystems. As with you know uh, many applications, different people have different ways of specifying keys to do separate functions, etc. And what we wanted to do was standardize that across the applications. And so that's one of the things that we're working on, um, updating certain keystrokes okay, um, to conform to what the users expect from modern operating systems. For example, Control S on Windows. Is Control S on Mac? Is Control S on Linux, right? And so you have these standard keystrokes that do standard functions. And uh, the problem is we now have to make sure that those are available <laughs> through the uh, Medley interface. Mako was the emulator and it was uh, initiated by Xerox. Mark picked it up, moved it to Sun OS X Windows, uh, which made it easy to move it to Linux because it was a C-based system. Um, a little difficult for Windows um, to interact for SDL to interact with Windows, Mac OS, and X Windows, but that's been solved. And I could say that since I've been running it now for about uh, six months, um, the Sigwin version, it, it works perfectly well. Um, Medley doesn't handle high resolution monitors, so that's being investigated. So the Medley, the Medley interface on D machines was usually uh, 1280 by 808 bit pixels, okay? But no color and no high resolution. And that requires either rewriting some code or extending some of the code for 
Windows management inside Medley. And that's not been one of our high priorities yet, though it's something on our agenda of items to work on. And um, as I said, three button mouse is a little bit difficult in some systems. We can do it in Sigwin with a uh, meta key. Um, I think they have some versions running in X Corps for Mac OS, but I haven't played with, I have a Mac at home that I hardly ever use. And, they're more interested. A lot of guys have Mac OS, and so they're really interested in getting that part to work. All right, adapting emulator to modern platforms. So I call these trials and tribulations because hey, they were difficult, right? They were hard. Um, modernizing the C code from Kernighan and Ritchie to at least to ANSI C89, okay? So when Xerox PARC and, uh, was developing the original emulator, the, the standard was the uh, ANSI standard based on Carnegie and Kernigan and Ritchie, which was circa 80, 83, I think, or 82, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. They had to fix some sloppy function definitions and usage that led to some compiler issues um, <clears throat> and uh, fix issues around signed and unsigned characters, add prototypes for functions. All this good stuff was basically to help the compiler understand, okay, how to generate better code, okay, based on the current definition. Um, so this list of issues is things that took quite a while, okay. Um, one of my colleagues had started working on this back in 2015 as an experiment, but he got really enthused about it in about 2019, 2020, and the work continues. And we're looking to improve the emulator as we go, okay. Um, one of them was to select the appropriate size for Lisp addresses and words. The D machines were 16 bits, mm. uh, except for the Dorado, which was 32 bits, but that was a separate implementation of Medley. So you had the 16 bit early D machines, had the 32 bit. Now we're trying to run on 64 bit machines, right? Requires some redefinition and some changing of types inside the C code and the Lisp code to make sure we can handle 64 bit entities, right? Uh, more trials and tribulations. I'm not going to bore you with these, but uh, just a bunch of things that to modernize, we had to update function calls. We had to update system calls with their parameters, um, uh, fix some problems like they didn't worry about uh, uninitialized memory. Okay. They just declared it and uh, hoped that uh, maybe the compiler or the operating system would initialize it. Some of that's gone away. So now you have to formally initialize memory. Uh, and of course, we were working for 32-bit compilation, but everybody now is 64-bit, so don't worry about that. Focus on 64-bit emulation, okay? Um, the online medley version I've mentioned uh, also, so I won't bother with overgoing that again. Initially used Docker, um, and I'm still using Docker, but uh, I think we're a little concerned about Docker's recent announcements about how they're going to deal with users and the free version of Docker. So we're, I think uh, one of my colleagues is reconsidering that now, um, but we're going to try and maintain the opera, the uh, online version, as I said, lowering the barrier to entry and getting people started. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of challenges. One of them is Medley does not have web support. So that means at some point on our agenda is a, uh, something to help support the web, web interfaces and stuff like that. Um, there are a bunch of programs out there we might be able to use, but they're gonna require, of course, some rewriting. Uh, no support for error keys. So you have the arrow keys on your keyboard, right? We don't have any support for those in Medley, okay? So we have to work on those. Um, limited pass through from Mako to Medley, sometimes data does not get propagated up. That just means that we have to figure out where that happens, rewrite the code, and perhaps add a little bit of medley code. Um, we don't know when in, in the interlist image quits or is idle. You can get online, and when you get online to create a online interlist image, you create a process. So then you can get online again and create another process. And we've had uh, multiple users online at once. Okay. However, the problem is the system, if the interlist quits, or close it, sometimes it doesn't, the operating system doesn't get notified. So Docker's still running. So we've got to fix that problem eventually. 
and it doesn't communicate with the browser because it is the OS in effect online. And so there, these are just things that are challenges. They are not going to be stoppers of continuing, but it's just, we only have about 10 people, we need more. And so the more we get, the faster we can address some of these things, okay? So who are we? Uh, original developers and users, uh, our applications, people, et cetera, and interested users in software archaeology. This is our website, okay? Our interlist org incorporated is a 501c3, so donations are welcome for anybody who wants to donate and help help us further. Uh, you can go to www.interlist.org. Get hub site, you're free to roam around it. Okay, you can't change it if you're not a, a authorized user by the group, but you can go and pull code down. You can pull the installers down for Mac OS or Windows for um, Linux. And I think there's one or two other. Oh, a couple of some of them are for different uh, processors like AMD and uh, Intel and so forth. Okay, I don't know if we have one for M1, M2 yet. I think that's coming. Uh, I haven't looked at the Mac OS side of it in a while. We have mailing lists. You can mail the core group, which is about 15, 20 people. Uh, there is a larger group for users and discussions. And as I said, we have a Zotero repository, which not only includes Interlisp, but information on Symbolics, on TI Explorer, uh, various other lists and things, applications associated with this. So it's got a fairly large um, set of documents there. We're in the process of reforming it to make it I would say easier for people to access and navigate, okay? Our goals, I've mentioned all these already, so I'm not going to go over them. The key thing is we started out with the idea of modernizing a system, okay? And also making information available to software historians. The idea being that we haven't really, now speaking as a computer scientist, right? Of 40 plus years, we have not, really done a good job of managing our history. And that's a real problem. There are books, some books out there, uh, few on uh, software, but there's a lot of software that just gets abandoned, okay? And so the goal is to, as we find that software, to preserve the documents and hopefully find somebody who might be interested in, for example, in writing a sequential history of some aspect of it, okay? Um, so how we operate weekly meetings through Zoom, everyone's a volunteer, okay? Uh, most of us work independently, but collaborate. Uh, we use GitHub to organize our information. That's why we have GitHub as the repository for the downloadable versions so that you can grab an installer, download it to your machine, click on it, boom, you've got a working interlist system, okay? And of course, the Zotero repository handles a common comprehensive set of Lisp documentation. And we're also going to put some Smalltalk out there since Xerox Park also built Smalltalk. And Smalltalk ran on the D machines as well. My, the first D machine I had access to had both uh, Interlisp and Smalltalk on it. And I developed a system called Golden Tiger for that particular agency written in small, actually, Xerox uh, Electro Optical Systems developed that for me. Uh, as an analyst workstation. All right, we're seeking collaborative efforts. We're looking for people. We'd like to have some universities uh, join us and have students work on this as master's degrees um, or maybe just uh, projects during a semester or whatever. Um, some of the ideas, develop a history of hypertext with note cards as a teaching tool, okay? One of the gentlemen who is um, the uh, author of uh, note cards, Frank Halas was one of the original developers of hypertext concepts at uh, Xerox Park. Uh, we would have people that want to use LFG for foreign languages, not just English, which is what our colleague works in. Um, online live demos, medley loops, note cards, etc. cetera. Um, native PDF capability would be nice and collaborate with museums to foster Lisp education. My, my opinion is Lisp is the only language you should be writing in, but you know that runs afoul of history and runs afoul of a lot of other objections. And so I don't want to get into any wars with people. Okay. Uh, we're also looking for other applications written in Interlisp. We know there were a lot out there because there were a lot of machines delivered 
um, from Xerox PARC before uh, they discontinued the D machines and stopped supporting intros. So if we could find people who are resurrecting those applications and could make them available publicly, great. We'd love to have them and put them into our repository. Um, and then here's just a bibliography of some of the things. Whoops, back up. Well, that's a subset, <laughs> of, a small subset of what's out there on uh, the repository, but a couple of them, uh, Strads is, uh, let's go back here. Strads, the Oreski article by Clark's, uh, Clarkson, Doug Lennon, and myself. Strads uh, is available. Uh, it's also on the site, was on the site website for a long, site core website for a long time as the precursor to Psych. So when Doug left MCC, well, when he started to do Psych, which was the common sense knowledge base on at MCC, this, this paper was one of the bases that he used for developing Psych. Um, or actually the ideas from Psych, the Strads was already working, it's just that I didn't document it until 1990. Um, and then there's a couple other papers. The interlist virtual machine specifications out there, that's the early version. Uh, it's never been updated, I don't think. So I'm pretty sure it's still the same, uh, the same virtual machine that's being used. And we haven't touched that yet, uh, except uh, for the, my colleague who rewrote the C code to make it better and work better. And uh, let's see, I think that's it. Okay, mm -hmm. going backwards. I don't want to go backwards. So thank you all. I appreciate your attendance. Uh, hopefully it was educational. Mm -hmm. and hopefully it uh, excites all of you to get involved with Interlist, right? <laughs> thank you. Oh, you can take questions. Sure, questions. Will you unshare your screen so that we can see? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, let me see. I got to go up here and say stop sharing. Let's see, I'm gonna scan these people and see if there are any of my students that showed up. <laughs> I didn't threaten them with anything. Uh, where is that mouse? No, that cursor. Oh well. Let's see. Oh, Abzetin's there. Good. Hello, Abzetin. He's my colleague from Azerbaijan. He's been to the School of Information Technology and Engineering there. I was just out there in April to give seminars and uh, also see my master's candidates that I sponsored last year. Um, and it doesn't look like any of my students there. All right, I'll, I'll figure out something to do with them. Mm -hmm. Stop sharing. Yeah, I stopped sharing. You wanna go back? Oh, I clicked stop sharing. So the green screen went away. Uh, the green rectangle about uh, the screen went away. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, you're not sharing at present. I'm not sharing at present, so it must not have. Uh, it must just be static there then. Uh, Arada's there too. Cool, good. A couple people I know from uh, Ada University in Azerbaijan. Yes, sir. Uh, I I know very little about Lisp. Can you explain why did Common Lisp take over? Two, uh, well, two re two main reasons I think. One was Common Lisp was sponsored by DARPA. Because Interlist was under control of, um, through the 80s and 90s mostly, uh, was under control of Xerox, right? And so all the changes were coming out of Xerox for the, the base machine and the infrastructure. Uh, and Xerox, want, uh, sorry, DARPA wanted a larger capability on a larger set of specific machines and operating systems. And the way Interlist was written at the time with a um, design built on the Xerox D machines would have meant that it would be very difficult at the time to move it to other systems, right? And so uh, DARPA said, okay, we're really pushing AI. And this is when I was at DARPA, 25 through 88, okay? Um, and they were really pushing LISP and the basis for AI, symbolic AI, as opposed to the uh, version that now exists, which we won't speak about, <laughs> okay? Um, and so they pushed it hard and they funded a number of people to work on common list, okay? As a uh, universal list for everybody. And that was, uh, I thought that was a great idea, but I'd wish they'd start with interlist, but they decided to go straight forward anew and start it over. And um, it was built by a committee and you know what happens with committees, <laughs> okay? So, 
Um, that's and and so people said, "Oh, DARPA is funding it. Okay, we got to pick it up and do it." So it appeared on uh, at the same time, roughly that same period. Uh, yeah, I forget his name. Um, Russell Green, I think Greenfield uh, started Symbolics. Guy TI got into the game with the TI Explorer, um, and there were and there was a, a deck Vax version. The first version of Interlisp that I actually used was an Interlisp 370, Interlisp VM for that came out of Israel. And I got and used on a uh, IBM 370 system. Um, so a number of versions were being propagated around, and they all were different in the sense in the sense that people were manipulating or modifying <coughs> the core functions. So they wanted to have a standard. That's not true anymore uh, for common Lisp either. And so you know. That's what the way it is, but uh, that's my take on it. Okay. Other questions? Silly one. Yes. When I program symbolics machines, I seem to remember we've got three special keys on the keyboard: the yeah. round key, a square key, and a triangle key. Yes. Is that one of the things you've taken on board? Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't looked at that. And I mean, you know, symbolics has been out of business for twenty years since the mid nineties, I should think. Yeah, I think so because uh, I had bought. Two symbolics machines, a 3650 and a 3670, for my uh, battle management program out at SyncPack Fleet, and installed them in the command center there to run our application. Uh, and I and I know that uh, I talked to the guy who succeeded me as the program director for that program, and uh, he told me they were kind of concerned because uh, symbolics was in failing straits and probably going to go out, and they did, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And uh, there's there's some symbolics machines that apparently are still working or limping along. I've read about once or twice. Um, I don't know what those keys did though. So we'd have to, I've got the manuals and we've got the manuals on the repositories. We'd have to investigate them. Um, and I have a bunch of symbolic code. In fact, I found the source code for Genera 7 online. So I subscribed it. That's part of what I do is go around and- You can't it so, with Genera on it. Yeah. So, we got to figure out what they did and see if it's worth uh, programming something to support them. Okay, and maybe even hosting Genera Seven uh, or pieces of it, I should say, because they have some different uh, applications, utilities than we do on Interlist. Maybe hosting those within our environment as well. But you know that requires a lot of work. And like I say, we got about ten to fifteen people that are the core of our group right now. Thanks. Yes. So uh, a question. Uh, I remember running Open Genera on my computer like uh, 15 years ago, <laughs> probably. Um, yeah. Um, so what would be the main differences in terms of um, like low level Lisp functionality between uh, Medley and Open Genera? Well, okay. So Genera, as I understand it, okay, um, came out of Scheme to a certain extent from MIT and from the MIT machines. So the cons, the catter, um, and then what was the, the K machine? Uh, yeah, the K machine. All those came out of MIT. Well, sorry, they were influenced by the MIT machines, but they were developed by Symbolics, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the structure would be that they were uh, Symbolics. Genera Seven was not the operating system for the machine at that point. It was built on top of the operating system. So we'd have to look back, go back. Somebody would have to go back and look at it and say, okay, what are the system calls? What are the function calls, unless you just wanted to preserve the function calls, but see what we do with common Lisp and inner Lisp is we said, okay, here's the common Lisp functions, here's the inner Lisp functions, using the package mechanism, we can get them to lay on top of the standard infrastructure and use the package mechanism to pick the particular implementation of the function. Mm -hmm. So if, that, if somebody wanted to do that, you volunteer. Right. Right? <laughs> uh, if, if somebody wanted to do that, I believe that what they would have to do is to do the same thing we did with uh, with looking at how to make sure that common Lisp and inner Lisp are integrated together. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we need another package mechanism, maybe SL or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, which would then select uh, Genera Seven functions. Um, I, I don't know much about Open Genera. I know that it, it's out. It was out there. I believe it ran on DEC also at one point. Or, yeah, uh, I don't remember what it was, but uh, it did run on my Windows. Yeah, uh, somehow I, I don't know how, but uh, yeah, I think I think that, that those that particular implementation, as well as most of the common Lisp implementations, 
-hmm. okay, dependent on the Windows system, uh, the Windows management system of the underlying operating system. I had a version of uh, Common List running on my Mac, my early Macs, when they were running System 7, System 8. And uh, they were running, they depended on QuickDraw and they depended on the Windows management system of the Mac operating system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they were, that was a pretty good implementation, unfortunately. And Apple supported it for a long time, but then they sort of abandoned it. And uh, then it went off to a separate company, Digitool. And then now it's open sourced, I believe. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to pick it up. To, there's some neat stuff in it, by the way, but I don't think we're going to pick it up to look at that, to integrate it. Maybe somebody would do it, though. That'd be kind of neat. I'd love to see that. I have a bunch of code that runs on uh, Mac on, on uh, the Mac OS. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, he hello. Uh, are you hearing me? Is that you, Abzettin? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. It's actually... It's it's a pleasure to hear you. It's not my first time. Uh, I'm joining this very uh, great event. Um, in in history, actually, uh, we have a saying: in order to build a successful future, you should know actually your your past. And what this society does, actually, it's very important for the development of of, of technology of computing. If if we look to what uh, Steve also mentioned. Uh, the, the symbolic AI, symbolic machine learning, and uh, and uh, statistical machine learning. Actually, this is exactly what we do uh, in statistical machine learning. Actually, we use the past the data we collected, and we learn what our model will do based on the, uh, our experience. Partially, it's true also for symbolic. Uh, and uh, what Steve does is very important, I think. Uh, a lot of people actually spend efforts in order to develop software using Lisp in the past. Of course, it's still questionable how effective it would be to, 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 to generate, to build something new based on the Lisp, but it's very important to, to use experience and use what actually others already did using a Lisp and try to develop possibly something new based on the experience and try possibly to, to, uh, to, translate the application solutions done using Lisp to, to something new, more popular uh, development frameworks possibly. Uh, and uh, I believe that what, what you do actually is very important, not just in terms of uh, what society general does in terms of uh, a look into to hardware, uh, of the, the past platform, but also uh, what Steve now uh, adding to the, to the activities of society in terms of uh, software, uh, in terms of uh, history of software, and how to uh, uh, use the history of software in order to develop something something new, come with uh, some new ideas. So thank you very much for the opportunity and invitation to, to join this uh, event. Mm -hmm. Talk to you soon, Ibsetin. Thank you. Thank you, Sinza. Uh, good. I hope you're doing uh, there well, and you have opportunity to enjoy your travel to, to London. Hmm. Any other questions? I know it's quarter four, and you all want to head out, so that's fine. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Steve. That, that was fascinating. Uh, I was impressed, I have to say, both by the range of your knowledge and skill, but also your enthusiasm. Yeah. And uh, that definitely came across as inspiring. So thank you very much. Uh, our next meeting, ladies and gentlemen, is on December the 14th. It'll be a film show uh, featuring Cray. Now that's spelt with a C, not a K. <laughs> <laughs> so we look forward to seeing you all then. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.